Greetings, adventurers, and welcome back to the Den of the Drake. Other dragons hoard gold while I hoard internet cringe. Well, 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 look who's back. Sorry for the delay in uploads. As we all know, life has a funny little habit of getting in the way. But there is one constant in this chaotic clown world that we all live in. And that constant is cringe. And a cringe hoarding drake such as myself can only stay away for so long. For my return, I wanted to get an extra spicy story for all of you to enjoy. Now normally, D&D games are some of the most fun times you can possibly have while sitting in your mom's basement. But I'm not exactly in the business of telling happy and uplifting tales of friendship, now am I? The story I have for you today stars a poor GM who finds themselves at the mercy of a moralizing spotlight hog, a tantrum-throwing crybaby, and a dude who thinks that being a psychopath is a fashionable style choice. Yeah, this triple play is about as crazy as it sounds. Now, without any further delay, let's go ahead and dive right into the horrifying world of r slash RPG horror stories. Enjoy. This week's story comes to us from user GreenEyes2020 and is titled The Three Worst Players I Have Ever Had to Deal With. Greetings. My name is GreenEyes2020. Longtime listener, first time caller. And these are my horror stories about the three worst players I have ever had to deal with in my time as a gamer. It's a gamer pad. Not many girls come in here because I get friend zoned so frequently. As a gamer, I don't get respect. Most of the horror I experienced happened in the world of darkness. Specifically, the new world of darkness, which is now in its second incarnation and is known as Chronicles of Darkness, but I digress. Not sure if this counts as NSFW or 18+, but better safe than sorry. Obviously, I will not be using these people's real names. So here are my experiences with Binky, Bonzo, and Bonk. All of this happened online via Roll20 and voice chat and everyone involved was a part of a larger online role-playing community. I am a forever DM slash storyteller slash master of ceremonies slash what have you, and I love it. Most of the time. For my experiences with Binky, we will find ourselves on familiar territory. I met Binky through a game of first edition Pathfinder that I had advertised in the aforementioned online community. Right off the bat, I should have noticed that there were a couple of red flags, but I was a lot younger and way more inexperienced than I am today. Binky was, in his own admission, a couple years older than I am. He cut his teeth on AD&D and would not stop espousing its superiority over 3.5 and, by extension, Pathfinder, which he saw as watered down. And this is me putting it mildly. But on the few times I called him out on it, he put up his hands, at least I imagine he did, I couldn't see him, and said, I'll be quiet now. He also tried to muscle in on how I ran the campaign, proposing all kinds of his own house rules and becoming passive aggressive when I shot them down as making things way more complicated than what was necessary. It wasn't as if he was trying to give himself an unfair advantage. Apparently, he wanted to recreate the experience of AD&D in my Pathfinder game. As a player, Binky was also a spotlight hog. And... complicated. How to best explain this? He played a pacifist cleric of Phrasma, Pathfinder's resident benevolent death goddess which he used as an in-game justification to give his character the moral high ground. He was always in the right, and everybody else was always wrong. 
no exceptions, even when confronted with overwhelming evidence to the contrary. Two occasions spring to mind. During the campaign, the party had managed to reach an independent city-state ruled by megocracy in order to request aid for another city that had been conquered at the beginning of the campaign. The characters had barely managed to flee. One wizard on the city council disagreed somewhat vehemently with Binky's cleric. So Binky decided that there was something fishy about that wizard, and the party should investigate the wizard's home while the wizard was absent. Now the wizards, sorcerers, and other magic users on the city council were on a much higher level than the party at that point in the campaign. If I remember correctly, they were around level 5. Despite in-game hints and exasperated out-of-game exclamations of, This is a really dumb idea, this is way too dangerous, Binky insisted, and the entire thing almost ended in a TPK thanks to some rather lethal traps and constructs. Binky complained that I was making things intentionally hard on them, but even the rest of the group told him to stuff it. The other occasion which also rang the death knell for this campaign was when Binky insisted, again, on wasting half an hour of in-game discussion with an NPC in order to again, prove his moral superiority. The NPC was a high-level monk, and the abbot of a monastic order dedicated to political neutrality, but they were empathetically not pacifists. Binky's argument was, if I remember correctly, that he was a pacifist and he fought more evil than the monastic order. Ergo, he was superior to them. Whether or not that holds, I'll leave that up to your judgment, dear reader. Now, this happened after an already very mentally draining session, and after that, two other players quit right on the spot. My enthusiasm for the campaign had also somewhat diminished, and that gave me the final push to end the campaign right then and there and to disband that group. Besides, I had recently discovered a third-party adventure path for Pathfinder, for evil-aligned characters, and I was eager to try that. When I advertised that campaign, I emphasized that the players would be playing evil characters. You know, criminals, bad guys, or girls or what have you. I'll allow anything. Binky applied for that campaign. His character concept? An innocent man falsely accused of good alignment, only going along with the evil stuff until he could clear his name. Then he would turn on the group. I gave that a hard pass and never spoke to Binky again. To this day, I have no idea how he thought that would fly. Okay, so we got a preachy dude who has elected themselves as the ultimate authority on morality, while simultaneously shoving themselves into the spotlight at all given opportunities so that they can scream into the void about how horrible everyone else is, while at the same time outing themselves as a hypocrite by purposefully ignoring their own faults. Tell me that you're a Twitter user without telling me that you're a Twitter user. It's actually kind of sad that this dude's character is someone that you can easily picture sitting behind a keyboard. But I guess that's the state of the internet these days. All we can really do is clutch our Amazon boxes close and hope that one of the millions of streaming services out there will be able to drown out the pain. As it relates to the game, however, I find that these lawful good moralizing kind of characters are just as annoying as the stereotypical chaotic neutral murder hobos. At least with the murder hobo, something happens. With these kinds of players, every time their characters open their mouths, you know it's going to end up with a long drawn out and shitty monologue. But I digress. With Binky covered, let's go ahead and see what Bonzo has in store for us. Now we come to Bonzo. 
And with him, we leave the familiar ground of Pathfinder and venture into the terra incognita of Chronicles of Darkness. Now, most people are probably familiar with Vampire the Masquerade, which is currently in its fifth incarnation, also known as V5. That, however, belongs to the classic World of Darkness. Chronicles of Darkness has its own RPG, in which you play a child of the night, a vampire. It is called Vampire the Requiem. Now, superficially, these are two very similar games. You are a vampire, you drink blood, you belong to a clan. That is where the similarities end, however. For a more in-depth explanation, please consult Wikipedia. I had advertised a chronicle in Vampire the Requiem, set in more or less present night Los Angeles. See, I couldn't set it in present day because that would be very detrimental to the vampire PC's health. In the advertisement, I also emphasized the difference between the two versions. Bonzo, however, still joined, thinking that Requiem was just Masquerade with some serial numbers filed off. I later learned that he had been a longtime player and storyteller in the classic World of Darkness especially Vampire the Masquerade. I also later learned that the guy was a right-wing conservative, and from my point of view, zealous Christian. So what was playing with Bonzo like? Well, he wasn't half as much of an attention hog as Binky, I'll give him that. His character had been turned as a teenager, and he played him as a permanently stuck in a hormonal high. Arguably, maybe not the best idea, but not without potential. Part and parcel of Vampire the Requiem is character development. Specifically, overcoming the rut a newly created vampire finds themselves in at the beginning. Could have been a pretty decent character arc. But Bonzo would pull something like turning three generic thugs into ghouls, and then mistreating them. Ghouls in Vampire the Requiem are humans that drink about a pint of vampire blood each month. In return, they stop aging, are no longer subject to normal diseases, and drinking vampire blood makes snorting cocaine feel so lame that Dr. Roxo would get jealous. Ideally, a ghoul serves their master in exchange for their monthly pint of blood, handling the literal day-to-day -day affairs. Yes, like the familiars from What We Do in the Shadows, but the ghouls are treated much better and get a much better deal on the whole. Now, ghouls also exist in Vampire the Masquerade, and the system is similar. If I can remember correctly, masquerade ghouls can be mentally controlled by their masters. That does not work in Requiem. Bonzo quickly lost interest in his ghouls, and told me that verbatim, I don't care about them, they can go rot in a cellar, confident that they would have to go do so. They did not. See, Requiem ghouls do not care whose blood they drink, as long as they get their monthly pint. They joined up with a group of vampires the PCs had made enemies of, and gleefully told them all about the PCs' assets and weak points. When the PCs thought they had the upper hand on their enemies, said enemy's counterstroke left the PCs flat broke. After weeks of building up their power base and establishing contacts, it didn't take the other players long to work out that Bonzo was responsible for this mess. Did he accept that? Hell no. He argued back and forth that this should have been impossible, since it worked that way in Masquerade. Except that, a point that I and the other players had repeatedly yelled at him, we were playing Requiem. Which is not Masquerade, and has never been Masquerade. And he still didn't get it. He seethed about it for a while and then acted like nothing had happened. For my part, I was happy to leave that behind. Then came the incident with his player's in-game lover, and a new player joining the group. Edit. 
a commenter reminded me that I had to clarify something here. Bonzo's lover was not part of his backstory. She didn't exist before the game started. She was an in-game creation conceived in a drunken fling between my imagination and a random name generator. Bonzo had told me that his character had started to grow cold towards his in-game lover, a mortal teenage girl about as old as he when he had been turned. Trigger warning, this might get ugly. He told me that this culminated in him torturing her to the brink of death and leaving her in a cellar somewhere. When the other PCs found her, she seemed to have died, and they had to quickly get rid of the body. Bonzo reacted with absolute indifference. Then a new player joined the Chronicle, and together with her and another player, we worked her and her character into the story. Our idea? She was actually Bonzo's former lover, whom the PCs had thought dead, but who had actually been in the process of turning into a new vampire. The technical term is embraced, and thus seemed only mostly dead. A passing vampire had spontaneously decided to turn her. Everybody enjoyed this. Everybody but Bonzo. He felt this character's backstory was directed at him as a punishment. It wasn't. But despite me repeatedly telling Bonzo this, he refused to believe it. He actually called me on a Sunday and whined about this for two hours, while I heard his wife in the background being angry at him for doing this during their weekly Bible study meeting. It was also during this time that his attendance became erratic due to real-life problems. He showed up one last time during an encounter with a particularly nasty mortal cultist, and then left the group for good, claiming that the game had become too dark for him. There was an aftermath to this, though. I found out later from a friend that he had started his own Vampire the Masquerade Chronicle, which didn't last past the second session, because all of his players quit in disgust after Bonzo had them encounter a vampire in a scene of gore that made the first two Evil Dead movies look like the most saccharine thing you can imagine. Full disclosure, I've never played any of the vampire RPGs since I'm not a fat goth kid, so I can't really speak to the accuracy of OP's claims to the differences between Requiem and Masquerade when it comes to the creation of ghouls. Because of my ignorance of sweaty goth culture, I'm just gonna have to take OP's word for it. But believe it or not, I'm actually having a hard time doing that because I actually see a pretty significant amount of fault in OP here. OP explicitly states that Bonzo's lover wasn't originally part of his backstory, and that she was created when OP had, and I quote, a drunken fling between their imagination and a random name generator. But what is not explicitly stated is OP getting permission from Bonzo to just insert something as significant as a love interest into his backstory. Because it's not explicitly stated, we have to go with what's in the story. And the only thing that's in the story is Bonzo's violent attempt to get rid of the thing that OP added. So going off of Bonzo's reaction, it's pretty obvious to me that he didn't want a lover. When we start reading between the lines here, I start to see a story of a DM who forced an NPC onto a player and then found a way to shove the NPC back into the narrative when she was rejected by the player, albeit in a needlessly violent way. Now this doesn't by any means excuse Bonzo's behavior, but I'm willing to assume that it explains it. And combine that with OP making snide little remarks like, uh, he whined about it for like two hours, as if he totally didn't just rewrite a player's backstory. Hell, at that point, I'd want to leave too. Also, I just want to point out at the beginning of this story, OP just randomly brings up this guy's politics and religion, as if it was going to be some kind of defining part of his personality, and then it never became relevant again. I honestly don't know what to take away from that, or what that says about OP and the way he sees other people. 
but I'm gonna do the smart thing and not go into it any deeper. I'll be honest, to me, OP was just as much, if not more, of a driving force in this confrontation as Bonzo. So I'm gonna be a bit more scrupulous as I read his encounter with our final antagonist. And now we come to Bonk. His first words to me were, Hi, I'm Bonk and I'm insane! Yeah, let that sink in for a minute. Bonk described himself as a clinical psychopath. I have, to this day, no idea if that's true. Although I'm 90-ish percent certain that he does lack impulse control. Bonk was somewhat younger than me, but not by much. Should I have regarded self-confessed insanity as a red flag? I have my own mental health problems, so who was I to judge? And most of the time, Bonk was perfectly amiable. The problems only started to accrue later. Bonk started playing in a chronicle of Mage the Awakening that I was running. Now that is a somewhat more obscure system of the world of darkness, and explaining it would take too long. Suffice to say, magic exists, and the PCs are some of the happy few who are able to use it. Bonk took to the concept like a duck to water. However, he took to the rules like a duck to merchant banking. Games in the world of darkness have a karma meter, basically a way to measure how stable a character is. Certain actions can threaten this stability. In general, the karma meter assumes that a common human is at worst a petty thief. Bonk repeatedly tried to pull stunts that fell under passionate murder which is much lower on the karma meter. When his actions demanded their pound of flesh, he complained about how this was unfair. When we explained it to him, he didn't understand. See, characters in the world of darkness are built around three concepts. A general concept of who the character is, for example, a tired bank manager, a flirty waitress, an escaped walrus, you get the point. The other two concepts are a strength of the character and a weakness or a vice. Vice means something like sloth or wrath, not drugs or sex. These concepts are meant as a semi-loose guideline for the player, and they can have a tangible effect. I am grossly oversimplifying this to make it understandable. Bonk, however, understood them only as cast-iron rules of behavior for his character, and he followed them to the letter. His characters tended to switch between two extremes like a very erratic metronome. These extremes led him to violate his karma meter. His karma suffered, and he complained that he was only acting out his concepts. Why was he always singled out, etc., etc.? Fun fact, Bonk also joined the Vampire Chronicles set in Los Angeles, and even he was disgusted by Bonzo's antics. But I could have forgiven all of this, yet I could not forgive what came next. Bonk cheated. See, that requires a bit more explanation. A mutual friend was running his own Mage Chronicle, and both me and Bonk were playing in it. During an expedition into a mystical site, our cabal, that's the word for a party of mages, had stumbled upon some powerful and important artifacts. Bonk's mage tried to abscond with them, and my mage stopped it. Now, in the beginning of the game, we had established that we couldn't use magic against each other as an in-game cabal rule. Bonk, somewhat miffed at having been thwarted, immediately announces, I'll turn back time for a do-over. Yes, that's possible in Mage the Awakening. Now, in character, he didn't say that aloud, but he didn't need to. Everybody else in the Cabal, myself included, had a pretty good idea of what spells he would use. Also, mages in Awakening can feel when magic is being woven in their general vicinity. 
While my character was not nearly as versed in Bonk's school of spells, they possessed a mastery of a spell school that dealt with magic itself. As such, while a mage generally can only counter a spell of one school with a spell of the same school, my character was capable of a universal counterspell. The second that I said I was going to counter his magic, Bonk cried foul and invoked the Cabal rule that we couldn't use magic against each other. Pull the other one, I said. You are about to turn back time. That magic influences all of us. If anything, that warrants my counter spell even more. Our storyteller agreed with my assessment and had us roll. It was at this point that he noticed a discrepancy. World of Darkness games work on a dice pool system similar to Shadowrun. Dice pools are almost always a combination of attributes and skills, and any roll higher than a certain number is a success. Chronicles of Darkness uses the d10. Any roll of 8 or higher is a success. Say you want to climb a wall. You combine your strength attribute of 2, which the game regards as an average human strength, and your athletic skill of 3. That gives you a pool of 5 d10s. You roll those, and as long as one die comes up as an 8 or higher, your character makes the climb. Bonk had been playing in this campaign as long as I had, and neither one of us had ever missed a session. On paper, our characters had gathered the same amount of experience. However, Bonk somehow managed to pull a higher dice pool out of his behind than what should have been possible. The storyteller chalked it up to negligence, but on a whim decided to compare Bonk's character sheet to the rest of the Cabals, and almost had a coronary. Bonk had more points in skills, attributes, and magical ability than the rest of the Cabal combined. The storyteller was livid, but tried to remain diplomatic and framed it towards Bonk as, uh, You probably made an honest mistake. I'll help you fill out the character sheet correctly. Even though he was about a hair's breadth away from kicking Bonk to the curb. Bonk was, at the time, also playing in another Vampire Chronicle that I was running, and he pulled a similar stunt, yet he tried to be more surreptitious about it, only moving a point here and there to give himself a minor advantage. Unfortunately for him, I am a paranoid bastard, so I caught that more or less immediately. I called him out on it, and then he promised to be better, and then proceeded to flat out ghost the group. At this point, I was fed up and removed him from the Chronicle and from my contacts. So those were my three worst players. Granted, it's not as grand as sexual harassment and or grievous bodily harm or playing under an absolute douchebag master instead of a dungeon master, but it was horror all the same. Fortunately, none of those guys managed to ever sour gaming for me. If anything, they made me dig my heels in even harder to provide a fun and safe environment for willing players to craft and experience amazing stories together. Thanks for reading. End of story. Okay, so here's some free life advice. If someone introduces themselves by saying, Hi, my name is blank and I'm insane. They're either A, actually insane, B, pretending to be insane because they think it makes them quirky, or C, both. None of these options are people that you want in your life. Personally, I think that bonk is a category B but I can't really prove that. Now, despite their questionable behavior during their story about Bonzo, I'm glad that none of these encounters soured RPGs for OP. After all, most people don't even meet one problem player at their game table. OP has met three, and is apparently still going strong, so I gotta respect that level of willpower.
Now before we go, let's take a look at this week's Gallery of the Drake. This week's fan art comes to us from viewer Melanie Neuschafer, and depicts a recording session with the Drake himself. You know, recently my agent has really been killing it with the voiceover jobs I've been getting. I mean, it's about time I've started getting more respectable roles as a voice actor. Hey Drake, I got good news for you. You're gonna be voicing Amethyst in the new Steven Universe reboot that Cartoon Network has planned. You're fired. Thank you again, Melanie, for submitting your art. If you want to see your artwork featured in Gallery of the Drake, be sure to send it to the email in my About section. Fan art is my favorite part of being a YouTuber, and it means the world to me that I can create content that inspires artists like you to create artwork like this. As you're all aware, I've recently taken a two-week break to focus on my classwork. Now that I'm back, the algorithm thinks I've been a very naughty boy. So to help me get back in the race, please like the video, comment, and subscribe. And if you feel like supporting the channel further, Patreon and merchandise links are in the description. I would like to thank you all for listening, and I hope to see you next time in the Den of the Drake.